So moving on to number 10, we're setting up an employment agency. Some schools call it a job chart. I'm just calling it an employment agency. What does that mean? That we're going to employ the children. Okay, it's not for pay. It's for something of much greater value. Self-esteem, being in control, self-discipline. That's what it really is about. We're going to set up the classroom so that there are jobs that the children are going to take upon themselves as responsible for this particular item. We've got about 11 items in number 10, so we're going to go 10.1 through 10.11. So for example, 10.1, we need an administrator in the classroom who's going to be the right-hand person for the teacher. The administrator will be in charge of being the liaison between the classroom and the office and vice versa. If there's a message from the office, he's responsible to get that message and bring it to the classroom. He will be responsible for the bulletin board. If you have a bulletin board in the classroom for any notices that go up, taking them down when they're no longer relevant, keeping them in a orderly fashion in how they are stuck onto the bulletin board of the classroom. The administrator will also be in charge of supervising the materials on the shelves, meaning before the end of the day, he will get an extra two minutes to supervise the shelves and make sure that there's nothing missing or if something is broken, he's going to be responsible for giving it to the right place to be fixed or re-laminated or re-copied if it got slightly torn or damaged from water. So those are some of the duties of the administrator. Other ideas that would be part of his responsibility, bringing photocopies from the office to the classroom. And lastly, if the teacher needs any notes to be written, so the administrator would be their right-hand person, so to speak, to make that note as a memo or reminder for the end of the day or for a message that needs to be written and taken to another classroom, another teacher, maybe to borrow something from another class or get permission for something, uh, whichever it is. Those are parts of the duties of the administrator of the classroom. 10.2 is we're going to appoint, employ, a phone receptionist. If you are privileged to have a phone in every classroom, nowadays that might be less common because of cell phones, but if you still have an intercom system where the phone might ring in your classroom, you want one kid who's in charge of answering the phone. And this becomes a class lesson in how you answer the phone. And you pick up the receiver and you tell the children, the first thing you say is, my name is Chaim. How can I help you? Someone is calling into the classroom. It might be the receptionist or one of the people working in the office with a message for the teacher, or it might be one of the parents calling into the school. You're responsible for that. Yes, thank you. I will do that straight away. Hold on. I'll call him for you. So help the children come up with what's the correct script, but the most important piece here is answering the phone with politeness and decor, meaning, my name is Chaim, how can I help you? How can I direct your call? What can I do for you? Um, but it should be an, an inviting, welcoming voice so that the children learn how to answer the phone instead of, yeah, who, who is it? What do you want? Oh, um, and then you, you keep the person hold while you're fetching that person. There's a, did, uh, what, what am I holding? Uh, do they hear? What, what are they doing? No, you want to say, my name is Chaim. How can I direct your call? How can I help you? Certainly. One moment, I'll, I'll call the teacher right now. Please hold. And just be polite in how you answer the phone. And this is something that you're holding the hand of the child and they're going to take turns in being the receptionist. And... It's all a matter of teaching the kids preparation for the adult world, for the real world. Moving on, after you've appointed your receptionist, we're going to go to 10.3. Who's that? Your Hachnasas Archim manager. Who's going to be in charge of taking care of guests when they come to the classroom? So you have a visiting parent, or you have someone observing from another school very common, or you have someone who's not part of the faculty, but is actually a visitor, then you want someone in charge of taking care of the visitor, which means, uh, good afternoon or good morning, whichever part of the day it is. My name is Chaim. I'm in charge of taking care of the visitors. So uh, would you like a tour of the classroom? Or can I get you a drink of water or a hot drink? 
if you permit children, first grade, second, third grade, uh, to make coffees and teas. In Montessori, that's extremely common. They actually do it in preschool as well. But that's something that children are trained in. It's not something you just do like that. Hot water can be dangerous. But you're trusting the children to take care of this guest, whether it's a hot drink that they're offering them or whether it's a cold drink. And you have a, an actual area in the classroom that is reserved for Hachnas Zorchim, for guests who are coming to visit your classroom. And what does that mean? There's snack and there's a glass, there's a water jug, there's a serviette, I think you call it in America a napkin. So whatever it is that needs to be on that little tray and the child will bring it off the shelf and bring it to where the visitor is either sitting observing the classroom or discussing with the teacher if they're having a, a brief meeting, whatever it would be, so that you're not doing this to impress the visitors. That may be a bonus. An add-on. That's not the purpose. The purpose is the mitzvah of Hachnas Asarchim. You have someone who's visiting your classroom, show them that there's someone who's looking out for them. And that's you. And your name is Chaim. This is where the bathroom is. Can I give you a tour of the classroom? If there's anything that you need, um, I'll be sitting over there. I'm working on that math work over there. I'm working with the psukim um, on that table over there. Please feel free to call me if you need anything or have any questions. So just teach the children very simple protocol of how to take care of a stranger, visitor, guest from outside coming to the classroom. If it's a parent, for example, um, parents want to feel that um, my school is doing a great job of chinuch. Now chinuch, strictly speaking, usually in the context of a school environment, refers specifically to academics. But we, we know that Kids need so much more than that. And to expect that mom and dad are doing all the chinuch at home may not be fo fully realistic, where many parents are both working one or even two jobs each in order to pay for school fees, in order to cover all the expenses, Yom Tov, Shabbos, etc. I'm not making that a judgment statement, I'm saying that as an observation, that many times children don't have parents at home that much at night, and when the parents are exhausted, I've had such a long day and at their wit's end to have to deal with the kids. So help the kids learn to be a bench in school so that they are more sensitive to people around them and know how to respond to other people's needs. Hachnasas Orchim Manager. Number 10.4. We're going to appoint a window cleaner and mirror cleaner in the classroom. Again, each one of these jobs is something that will either be a through a girl, or will rotate alphabetically. Like the Mishmaras in the Beis HaMikdash of the 24 groups of the Kohanim, so they took turns. Over the year, each group ended up having two full weeks in their taking care of the areas of Avodah that they were responsible for. So we're, we're simply following structure. How do you put structure in place so that the functioning, which is the learning, the function, which is the interpersonal relationships, the functioning, which is respect for the teacher, the function, respect for each other, is so much easier where the expectations are part of the learning environment. So in 10.4, you want to appoint someone who's going to be in charge of cleaning the windows and the mirrors. So if there are any mirrors in the classroom or in the adjacent bathroom, yes, there is a janitor, but gosh, you're going to save a lot of money doing this. And you're teaching responsibility. And we're not talking about heavy duty work. We're talking about teaching the children the pride of doing something that is a contribution to the community. In this case, it's my classroom, but we're also a community. In some ways, perhaps the, the most important community in my life, in preparing me for a contribution later on. So show them how to use the Windex. No, it's not a spray gun. No, it's not a spray gun. <laughs> it's a Windex for cleaning windows. Show them how to use the dry towel, or if you're using paper towels, show them how to clean a window to make it shine and clear, how to remove the dirt, how to wash one's hands afterwards, if necessary, how to wear the plastic rubber gloves for doing that type of work. The most important piece here is responsibility. You're teaching the children to be able to respond to needs around them. Because one day they're going to be parents. One day they're going to be a spouse. And in running the home, there are duties. And if you can afford help, great. If you can't, guess what? 
you're going to pitch in and share in taking care of maintaining the apartment that you're renting or the house that you've just paid for and you take pride in. That's what we're talking about. The last part of 10.4 is safety comes first, which means if you have a classroom and you've been blessed with a very high ceiling, let's say 20 feet, and you've got these enormous windows that go up like 18 feet and don't give the kids ladders to climb 18 feet. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about safety first. Make sure they know how to use the spray gun. No, it's not a gun. It's a spray gun, spray bottle. Anyone who violates the privilege they have for being entrusted with the responsibility for the good of the class will lose that privilege until they're ready to say, I realize my mistake, I'm ready to take on the responsibility of being a window cleaner again. Let the kids learn from each other to take pride in these responsibilities and let them understand that it's a matter of being trusted with something that makes you feel good about yourself because you are being in control of yourself. You're not being selfish, you're sharing. That's being in control of yourself. None of us love not being chesedic. None of us really want to be selfish. None of us want to be so self-centered that I matter and you don't. No, 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 no. We're teaching an inner discipline that the children themselves will glow and shine inwardly from because they realize you are teaching me how to take control of my life. And part of that is learning how to be sensitive to the needs of the community in the classroom that we're all sharing in. So... There's a lot of psychological midas and good things that are taking place over here. I'm sharing with you the structure, the protocol that leads to function, enables the class to be a learning environment, a teaching environment, somewhere where the children are interfacing with each other and the teachers in a very respectful, loving way. 10.5, sanitation manager. If you don't want to use that term, come up with something else. Sanitation manager means you're going to have someone who's going to be in charge uh, making sure the table surfaces are washed down by the end of the day or in preparation for lunch if you're having lunch in the classroom. If you need more than one sanitation manager for efficiency then appoint two who are going to be partners in this business. Yes they're not getting paid in the conventional sense but they are being paid in a completely different value system that's even more valuable than money and that is who I am becoming because of my ability to take responsibility. Who I am becoming enriched by, by myself. Because I am doing something for the good of all of us, not just everyone else, it's for me too. So sanitation manager is going to be in charge of the garbage cans, make sure they're emptied out into a larger bag that might be outside, replacing the bag that's full. Again, of course, if there's any sharp objects in there or any reason to be concerned for safety, that's always a first consideration. And that would be a discussion about if there's any sharp objects in there, uh, you might want to give that to the janitor to actually do. But initially, what I'm bringing out is let the children feel responsible for throwing things into the garbage, removing the trash bag and replacing it, sweeping the floor near the end of the day so that there's a beautiful, clean environment for the children to return to the next morning. I know there's going to be janitor anyway that will probably go over everything, but the, the idea over here is why should I take on the mentality that I can make a mess that you clear up for me? That's not responsibility. Why would someone else have to clear up my mess? So in building a community in this classroom, we want to take pride in the physical environment that we're living in and that while we are, we want it to be clean and tidy when it's work time and it's a busy mess, that's a busy mess, it's not a real intrinsic mess, it's a busy mess. But once we're finished with the work cycle, things get put away. Pencils are put over here, your books are put over here, so that you leave the environment at the end of each part of the day, whether it's for going to recess or at the end of the day, you're leaving it in a way that is functional when you return. So it's again structure in preparation for function. Moving on. 10.6. Who's going to be the caterer in the classroom? Caterer means who's in charge of making sure if the school's providing snacks that there are enough snacks in the classroom for this day or week. 
Who's going to be in charge of making sure that there are enough plates and cups and drinks? So the caterer is in charge of all that. If he needs to go to the office to reorder or ask where do I find a new stock, of cups, he'll bring them to the classroom. If you want, you can have a system whereby the caterer, as soon as there's low supplies of cups or plates or cutlery, informs the administrator of the classroom who's in charge of liaising with the office. So you can go either way there, but the idea is delegation, responsibility, sense of contribution, sense of sharing, building community. Community is about people. It's about people being able to interact and trade talents, strengths, commerce, barter, products. Over here is just preparation for all of that. 10.7. We are now up to who's going to be the botanist in the classroom. That means someone who's in charge of the flowers. If you've got flowers or plants, who is taking care of making sure they're watered, whether it needs sunlight, whether it needs to be pruned slightly. Who's going to be in charge of the plants and the flowers in the classroom? Plants and flowers, it's just a good idea because, number one, it brings oxygen, duh, that we kind of need. And uh, it does, definitely helps oxygenate the classroom. But it also is something that is aesthetically beautiful to have flowers and plants in the classroom. Someone has to take care of it. So let that be a rotation of botanists throughout the whole class. And what you're going to find is that the kid who loves plants or may find he falls in love with plants is going to now reveal a personal talent or strength or sensitivity to that part of nature that a Kaddish Baruch created in the Bria. So that will become a revelation to you as a teacher to know this kid loves botany. He may be more endeared to learning about the function of plant life and learning about the parts of a leaf or parts of a tree, all because he was a botanist one week in the year and that brought out this natural talent or personal strength that they are sensitive to the physical environment, the natural environment of plants and flowers. We're now up to 10.8. Who's going to be the zoologist in our classroom? If you're going to have pets in the classroom, there might be a pet gerbil or hamster or snake or I don't know what. Uh, some classes have rats. I'm not personally in favor of some of those ideas, but it is a way for children to take care of some of the Kodesh Baruch's creatures. And you want a zoologist who's going to be in charge of the fish tank. And that means learning what food the fish need and how often they get fed. And that goes for the different types of animals that you might have in the classroom environment. It might be part of an experiment in the science part of your classroom where there would be a need for an animal in the classroom. Who's going to be in charge of that? That would be the zoologist. One last point, if the animals are the ones that kind of lend themselves to making a mess, and that kind of is quite natural for animals to do, you really want to make sure that the kid who either volunteers or has been chosen to be a zoologist actually really wants to do this job. And if he doesn't, then let him be the zoologist for all the other tasks except for cleaning up the cage if that really is like repulsive to him but there are children who are not repulsed by that and actually they might actually really enjoy as part of it taking care of that particular pet that way there are some kids even in the religious community i'm not saying it's frequent that do have dogs in their home and so they probably are not so mephunic or finicky or delicate about having a pet in the classroom that when it's their turn to be a zoologist are actually in charge of cleaning up their mess too but again you might need the consent of parents on uh, one or two of these responsibilities in case parents have a, a specific objection or in the case of Hasfram allergies there may be a reason why you can't have a specific type of pet in the classroom so safety first that's always number one safety first so 10.9 who's going to be our polish expert that means if you have any silver or glass in the room as part of your physical environment then who's going to be in charge of polishing it? So there's a routine and there are specific tasks of how to polish silver. So that becomes a lesson in of itself that you can give to the whole class. And then on the chart for your employment agency, that job will rotate amongst the children and they'll know what to do, whoever is in charge of polishing silver. If you have Shabbos candlesticks and a silver becher, that you might be practicing Shabbos Kiddush or 
Coming closer to Pesach, you might have silver in the classroom where you make a mock seder with Arba Koises with four beautiful wine glasses or wine bechers which are silver. So that's where it might come in. So it might be periodical as opposed to throughout the whole year. But those are examples where you might want a polish expert that's going to take that job on. 10.10 is who's going to be our class scribe? Who's going to be the cipher in the classroom? What responsibilities will the class cipher have? So the class scribe will be in charge of any notes that the teacher wants them to write, maybe even to write and then give to the administrator to take to the office. Or what I like best of all in, is this particular task, and that is any new words the teacher uses throughout the class, throughout the day, that are new words for the children. And I encourage, it's very, very big, we'll talk about it in a different part of the training, but it's really important that teachers as adults talk to children as adults and not down to them as young children. Because if you really want to build exponentially the vocabulary of your kids in your classroom, in your home as well, then talk with your own vocabulary. Because ha guess how the kids figured out all the words that they know till now? It wasn't because they're sitting looking up a dictionary trying to figure out a new word that they just heard, how to spell it, no! They learn it from context, they learn it from repetition, they learn, they, they've heard the word so many times and in so many different contexts that they start to figure out when it makes sense and when it doesn't and then they figure out the basic definition of that word. But when you're teaching in the classroom, use your regular vocabulary and deliberately throw in words which are sophisticated and then ask the class, does anyone know what this word means? But the major function in my personal understanding of this is really you want a class scribe for any vocabulary words which the teacher will now use that are kind of more sophisticated than what the children are used to. Dafka use your adult vocabulary in order to bring out in the children new words because guess what? The more words you've got up here, the more you can communicate to yourself about what you experience, what you see. The more words you've got in your vocabulary bank, in your brain, the more you're able to communicate to yourself and to other people. I don't want to pull out any particular sex, but I was working with a number of different sex, wherever it was, whose English was very poor. And the language which they did speak was very sparse. It wasn't expanse. It didn't have lots and lots of words uh, that had an equivalent in English or in Hebrew. So it made it actually hard for them to communicate. But then I realized something. If you have a limited vocabulary, and that's your mother tongue, you actually have a limited vocabulary to talk to yourself and tell yourself what you're thinking or what you're feeling because you don't have that much vocabulary. So you end up not being dumb because you are dumb. You end up dumbing down yourself because you don't have enough vocabulary to be able to communicate to yourself what you're thinking and feeling, let alone share with other people what you're thinking and feeling. It's a terrible, terrible way to cap a child. So I'm proposing that a teacher should specifically use adult vocabulary, even if it's very sophisticated, in order to then ask the children, oh, what does sophisticated mean? What does the word circumference mean? And when you give the definition, if they don't know it, have them, uh, Moshe, can you tell us what circumference is? Very good, it's the line around the circle. Uh, Chaim, can you tell us what a circumference is? Uh, yeah, outline of the circle, very good, that's a, that's a good definition too. And you go around the class with two or three kids, and they learn that every time you are going to say a new word and you teach it to them the meaning, the class scribe has to write it down. Not the definition, just the word. Part of the routine and ritual on a daily or weekly basis will be going through these vocabulary words where the children will be building their vocabulary because the more you build their vocabulary, the more they can talk to themselves and to others. And the more they will be able to understand, the more they'll be endeared to learning new words. You're helping them communicate to themselves. If you want to get more information on this, there's a brilliant educationalist. Her name is Marva Collins. Her first graders in Chicago, kids who come from broken homes, children born out of wedlock, don't even know who their real father is, and parents of a brother, older brothers in gangs or being killed or in, in prison. I mean, really, education is not high on the list. Street smart, that's right at the top. Being macho, that's next on top. Being able to bully others, intimidate others, that's right at the top of the list. So she comes into this classroom of first graders. She eventually became the principal and she was invited by three different presidents to be the minister of education. Refused every time because she wants to be in the classroom.
And by the end of first grade, I kid you not, you can check her out, the Marva Collins way. By the end of first grade, she would have first graders reading Shakespeare. I kid you not. And describing the plot, describing the dynamics of the different characters in the play. And it's mind-blowing. First graders, I, give me a break. They must all be geniuses. No, 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 no. All she did was build a vocabulary every day. She would talk to them in an adult vocabulary and she spoke to them, I'm not going to into details now, really straight, telling them, you, if you want to be a nobody, carry on the way your parents and brothers are. If you want to be a somebody, if you want to get yourself an education and be able to have goals that you fulfill and be rich because you earned the money instead of stole it, then you're going to enjoy this class because I'm here for you. She was really straight with the kids. And what she was able to do was build their vocabulary daily by introducing new words, adult words, sophisticated vocabulary, that she would go around the class, two or three or four kids. Um, Simon, uh, what's, what's that word again? Michael, can you say it in your own words? And the kids knew that they're going to get called upon in, you know, spontaneously. So they were listening, paying attention. And they started realizing they were using these words in their conversations. And they started building their minds because that's what vocabulary does for you. When you build up vocabulary in Lashna Kodesh, Lahavdil, what ends up happening is you're giving more and more access to the Torah. The more you understand parts of speech, the shoresh in the middle, the prefix suffixes, shemushim on the sides, guess what? You're building the child's access to Hashem's words in the Torah, in Chumash, later on Mishnah, Gemara, etc. So it's not a small thing that I'm offering here. I'm saying part of your daily conscious effort in teaching children is use sophisticated vocabulary, adult vocabulary, and have your scribe, the class scribe, write down that word which gets added to a list that is every single week reviewed in class with all the children. And they start building up 10, 20 words a week, 30 words a week. That's about 100, 120 a month. And at three, four months, you've got a thousand new vocabulary words, which adults usually use. You don't usually hear it from a first, second grader. This is not to impress visitors or impress the menahel or parents. This is reality teaching. This is where kids are capable of rising to your expectations of them. All you have to do is set the standard so that they know what to expect from you. And when they see that my Mora, my teacher, my Rebbe is about building my mind, guess what happens to discipline? They'll protect you. They're not interested in someone else messing up in the class. They will, they will protect your covered because they have so much covered for you. They will not be interested in being a discipline problem. I'm not saying that there's not going to be any discipline problems, but you're going to decrease it enormously for the fact that they respect you as a teacher for building their minds. So assign a class scribe for writing up the new vocabulary that comes every day. Make sure you do that. In a con make a conscious effort of it. And... If you yourself don't feel you've got that much good vocabulary, so go check out a dictionary and learn one or two or three words a day and introduce them into the classroom. And let it become part of your vocabulary. Forgive me for speaking that way. I've seen in the teacher training that sometimes the products of our own system uh, have not necessarily put a big stress on English diction. And to that extent, the teachers are sometimes themselves limited. I don't mean that has for shalom as a a denigration or a negative, I'm saying as an observation. And if you're going to be in an Alpidarka classroom, in that case, any classroom, this is not, this is not Miyuchad exclusive to Alpidarka, but it happens to be part of the Alpidarka training, then adopt this discipline of using sophisticated vocabulary for children to build their minds. 10.11, who's going to be our class librarian? What does that mean? Every classroom should have its own library and you should build that library. Get the funding one way or another because books is the child's entree to the whole world. The Ramchal offers in Derech Hashem that part of this Syata Tishmaya, the heavenly assistance a person gets in their learning Torah, comes from they're covered for Sfarim. They're covered for books. Of course, we're talking about Sfarim HaKadoshim, but... The children should learn to have respect 
for books, even secular books. Why? Because these books are giving us information about Nifla Sabere, geography, science. And for a child to learn respect for these books, you want a librarian who's the supervisor in charge of making sure books are put back where they belong, in the library, on the shelves, if you have a specific place for different types of books, and also to be in charge of the condition of the books. If they are torn, they need to be repaired, whether he, that child themselves will do the repairing or bring them to the office or send them to the, give them to the administrator to give to the office for repair or replacement. The librarian will be in charge of if there's going to be a list, if this is something that you have as part of the school protocol, where you actually have a list where children are able to borrow a book from their classroom library to take it home. So then the librarian is going to be in charge of making sure that the children have put the date and the name of the book and their name, the child's name of who's borrowing it, and when the due date is back. And then the class librarian is in charge of noticing when that due date is and reminding the child who borrowed the book to bring it back. Again, you don't have to do this, but these are very powerful, simple ways to build children's self-esteem. Self-esteem, please don't get me wrong, has little or nothing to do with talent. And, and the real world proves it, because you've got people who are the most brilliant experts in their area of expertise and hate themselves. You've got the most amazing basketball players and athletes and actors and actresses. You've got people who are famous and adored by millions of people. You've got comedians, Robin Williams, who, who, could, who could be adored and loved and has caused hundreds of millions of people to laugh and still does, and he commits suicide. What's that say about self-esteem? Self-esteem is not correlated to talent. It could be, but almost never is. You know why? Because self-esteem is Selim Elokim. It's really the image that you and I were created by Kodesh Baruch Hu. What Selim Elokim really mean? The real us is not our body. The real us is not our clothes. The real us is not our homes. The real us is not our career. The real us is not our car. Duh. The real us is who are we inside. That's the Selim Elokim, a reflection of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Now what does Elokim mean? Unlimited power. That's what Hashem is. Elohim. El means power. Elohim means powerful powers. You and I are created as an unlimited reflection of Hashem's unlimited power. How can that be? And the answer is, there's no limit on how loving, respectful, giving, generous, listening, empathic, compassionate, forgiving, understanding, happy, Everything that's in the realm of Midas is who you're developing yourself internally to become. Oh, that has all to do with controlling your mind, controlling your mouth, controlling your actions. So by giving children responsibility as young children and give them responsibility to be contributors in the classroom, in building community, in being in charge of supervising, you're giving them opportunities to develop the Tselem Elohim inside of them, that very deep need to be appreciated and admired for who we truly are. We are here to be givers. We are here to share. We're here to contribute. We're here to do chesed, which all of these jobs are doing, especially you're not getting paid, but you're getting paid in a much greater way because who you are inside is getting enriched, even if your bank account isn't. And it's probably preparation for you being a responsible adult in your career too. So please don't take this lightly. This whole area of 10.1 through 10.11 is all about nurturing the Tselem Elohim inside a person because that's true self-esteem. True self-esteem is self-estimation. The real self is the Elohim, the Tselem inside of us. Oh, so talent, you might be born or have talent that's been nurtured, but it won't necessarily equal self-esteem because that's not the real you. You could be a most brilliant athlete. You can win gold medals every single Olympics and still hate yourself because you're, but this person is rotten in their marriage or to their children. And we know that mitos is what counts the most. So you can see I'm very passionate about this. Make these 10.11 items, these 11 items in number 10, make them a priority that you build the classroom based on the community on sharing.